Let us all stand on our feet in honor of the word of God. Let us read together in the count of three. One, two, three. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I thought it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. This is the word of the Lord. You may all Praise be, be to God. You all may be seated. So we are in our second sermon on the book of Galatians. Now have you ever heard people sharing their conversion testimony? Because today our text, we're going to hear what is probably the most conversion testimony in church history. Now, I know some preachers often say that this is how God turned Saul into Paul. I know it sounds cool to say that, right? See how God changed from Saul to Paul when he became a Christian? But that's not true. Because Saul did not change to Paul when he became a Christian. Saul is his Jewish name, and Paul is his Roman name. And Paul tells his conversion testimony a couple of times throughout the Bible. Why? Not because he wants attention for himself, but because Paul believed wholeheartedly that there's something about his conversion that reflects the life-transforming power of the gospel. And here's what's amazing about Paul's testimony. Usually, when we listen to people's testimony, it tends to be very subjective, isn't it? Like, for example, when you hear people tell their story, they say things like, you know what? I used to be addicted to alcohol. I used to be addicted to sex, drugs, and everything. But, you know, when I met Jesus, I was set free from those addictions, right? Or maybe some of your story goes like, I used to find no meaning in life. I tried everything. I tried career. I tried relationship. Nothing worked. But finally, when I met Jesus, I found meaning in my life. So they speak a lot about what they experienced and how God changed their life through the gospel. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's not enough. Paul will show us that the gospel is not only subjectively true, but it's also objectively true. Because if the gospel is only subjectively true, then the gospel is not true. It also works the other way around. Because if the gospel is objectively true, but if not subjectively true, then it is not life-changing. Then it is not the gospel. Because the gospel is the very power of God that radically transforms life. It is life-transforming gospel. But let's make it clear first. Do you know the difference between objective and subjective evidence? Objective evidence is about very viable facts. Subjective evidence is about the effect the experience has on us. Okay, let me give you one example. You hear me often say, if you've been in this church for a while, you hear this a lot, Kailu makes the best fried rice. And I'm not joking, okay? Her fried rice is the bomb. So let's say I say, Kailu make fried rice for you. By the way, this is just an illustration. Do not go asking her for fr making her fried rice for you because let me tell you, it won't happen. Kailu fried rice is given the same way as salvation. Only those who are chosen get to taste it. 
you don't choose k a i l u fried rice. k a i l u fried rice chose you. But let's say that I tell you k a i l u make fried rice for you. How do you know it's true? How can I prove that this fried rice is actually come from k a i l u It's not and not some some cheap imitation of my own cooking. Well, here's what I can do. I can show you the note that she personally wrote for you, or I can show you show you the video of her making that fried rice. Okay? That's called objective evidence. But subjective evidence is when you taste that chosen fried rice for yourself and realize that fried rice this good can only be made by k a i l u You with me? That's subjective evidence. Now let me tell you why it is very important for us to know how the gospel transform p o s t life. Because every day you and I are being exposed to all kind of gospel that is not gospel. Because if you remember our last sermon on Galatians, first sermon, Paul is clear that there is only one gospel, and it is the gospel that Paul preach. It is the only gospel that has the power to save. There's no other gospel. And if we call ourselves Christian, here's the good news: we are saved by the same gospel. And that gospel must produce both objective and subjective evidence in our life. We can't choose one over the other. We must not choose. Listen, Christianity is both head and heart religion. And let me tell you why this is important. Because right now in our church we have interesting mix, right? In our church right now, we have some of you who came from reform background, and they tend to emphasize objective evidence. What is important is the head knowledge. What matter is doctrine. You can easily tell who they are because when they sing, this is what they do. Hmm. The music s too loud. The lyrics not so biblical. Okay. Ah, oh, what's what's up with the guitars? Too loud. Too loud. Okay. So this is what they do when they worship. So some of you are very, very, very doctrine-driven, and that's not wrong. But there are some of us here who are more charismatic-driven. Charismatic is your background, so you're like, "Come on, Felix, pump it up, be louder, louder!" And the louder Felix play, you're like, "Hmm, this is it. I feel the anointing." That's why when you see me worship, you're like, "Oh yeah," because I came from charismatic background. That's me. So for charismatic, what importance is heart emotion, experience? Now almost everybody tend to lean to value one over the other, but let me tell you something about Christianity. Christianity is radically different. Why? Because Christianity is both. It's head and heart joined in the gospel. So here's what we must get: the gospel does not bring the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. And the power of God come into our life through objective truth, and this truth radically changes us. So the gospel is both objective and subjective, and we must embrace both. And we're not really Christian until we do. Head and heart. So I have three points for my sermon: the origin of the gospel, the objective evidence of the gospel, and the subjective evidence of the gospel. And as you listen throughout the sermon, you will probably keep asking, "Where's the application?" Relax; it will come in two months' time, when we get to chapter five. So, Galatians chapter one, two, three, and four, we're going to deal a lot about what is salvation. How does how are we saved by God? Then, in chapter five, which we're going to get probably in, in November or December, then we talk about so what. Okay. So, for the next couple of weeks, months, we got to jump in into what is it that makes Christianity such a good news. Look at the first one: the origin of the gospel, verse 11 and 12. For I will have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let me let me refresh you the context of the book of Galatians, because you remember, Paul is the man who founded the churches in Galatia. Paul taught them the gospel, but not long after that, Paul left for his missionary journey, and the other teachers from Jerusalem showed up in Galatia, and this is what they do: they question Paul's teaching and authority. So their line of questioning goes something like this: Well, you know, yes, Paul is a good teacher; we can tell. He taught you the gospel, and that's great. 
But where did Paul get his gospel from? Who authorized him to preach the gospel? And let me tell you, Paul's gospel is great, but it's not complete. After all, Paul is not one of the 12 apostles. He did not receive his teaching directly from Jesus, but you know who did? The 12 apostles in Jerusalem. And we came from them. And we are here to tell you, to teach you the better gospel, the more improved version of the gospel. And this is what you're lacking in your understanding of the gospel. And that is why in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul opened the letter by saying, listen, my apostleship is not from man, not true man. I receive my authority directly from Jesus Christ. That's verse 1 and 2. And now in verse 11 and 12, Paul defended his gospel. And he will continue to do this in chapter 2. And here's what Paul say. Paul say, the gospel he preached is not man's gospel. Let's pause here a bit. Because Paul is very clear here that the gospel cannot be, cannot be man's invention. Do you know why? Because the gospel goes against our natural human instinct. The default mode of human heart is religion. What is religion? Religion is works righteousness. It means that in order for me to be accepted by God, then I have to work hard. I have to do something. I have to earn it. I have to strive for it. And isn't that what every other religion teaches us? There's a standard that we must meet before we are good enough to receive salvation. And this feels natural. But the idea of free salvation by grace is extremely offensive to human heart. Let me give you an example. As many of you know, um, I am a high achiever. I'm the type who is over-prepared for my exam and whines for the whole day if I do not get a good grade. When I was still in college, my MC knew this, I whined to them about my Greek and Hebrew exams all the time. Okay? If you were in my MC, thank you for being patient with me at the time. I whine all the time. Okay? So in every class, usually, you will find two opposite spectrum. At the end of one spectrum are people like me, the high achievers. At the opposite of the spectrum, we call them the partiers, who do just enough work to get a pass. Just out of curiosity, just want to know. How many of you lean toward the high achiever? Can I see your hand? The high achiever. Okay. How many of you are the partiers? Can I see your hand? Okay. Most of you. Okay, that's okay. Jesus loves tax collectors and sinners more than the Pharisees. That's fine. So let's say there's a final Greek exam that is worth 100% of the grade. And I spend weeks preparing for the exam while the party is crammed everything a few hours before the exam. And as expected, of course, right? I did well in the exam. And the partiers did very poorly. I look forward to receiving my grade while the party is already thinking, how can they appeal for mercy from the professor? And then two weeks later, we receive an email that said that our grade was out. And when I check my grade, I'm like, praise be to God, the God of heaven and earth. I dance and celebrate because, of course, me being me, I got a high distinction. Then tears fall from my eye, all my hard work's paid off, and then all the sleepless night, the time that I spend studying, is all worth it. I deserve to get high distinction. But surprisingly, the partiers also dance and celebrate. Apparently, they not only get a pass, but they also get a high distinction. Because the professor decided to give everyone in the class who attended the exam high distinction. What happened next? Well, everybody should be happy with high distinction, right? Well, of course not. Do you know who will write an email to the professor, to the dean of students, the principal, and the minister of education complaining about this bizarre incident? Why OSIA? Moi. Why? Because that is not fair. How can they, who did not study, get the same grade as me, who spent hours studying for my exam? It is unfair. Can you see where I'm going with this? We are, by default, creatures of earning and deserving. 
the fact that we receive salvation freely because of God's grace is extremely offensive to us. We do not like it because it crushes our pride. The gospel tells us that salvation has nothing to do with us and solely based on God's decision. We don't like that. We want to be the subject of salvation, not the object of salvation. And we think this is only a problem for non christian and then after we become Christian, we accept the gospel, we're no longer affected by it. The book of Galatians are written for people like you and me. Because even though we believe the gospel, we continue to look to our performance to tell us how we are doing before God. We continue to mix the order between justification and sanctification. Okay, let me explain to you what that means. Here's the right order. Justification, our acceptance as righteous before God, lead us to sanctification. That is our progress in holiness. Which means, because right now I'm accepted by God by grace, because of what Jesus has done for me, now I can live a life that is pleasing to God. Justification leads to sanctification. But we often switch the order, don't we? Here's the order that we live by. Sanctification, our progress in holiness, leads to justification. Our acceptance as righteous before God. So in other words, even though we believe the gospel on a day-to-day basis, we rely on our sanctification, how well I perform before God, for our justification, for our acceptance before God. We think God will only accept us if we are pleasing to God. This feels natural. And the gospel goes against our natural instinct. Because the gospel tells us that salvation has been done. All we can do is receive freely. We are already accepted by God before we do a single thing for God. This is counterintuitive. It humbles us. That is why Paul said the gospel is not man good news about God, but God good news for men. It does not originate from Paul or any man. It originates from God's heart. And that is why Paul goes on to say in verse 12, he did not receive the gospel from any man, which means the gospel is not tradition handed down from the previous generation. He also says, says that he was not taught the gospel, which means he did not learn the gospel from any human teachers, including the apostle. But he says, he received the gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ, which means that God himself made the gospel known to him. So get this. The gospel is not an invention or a tradition. It is a revelation. Paul is not only an apostle sent by Christ, but his gospel originated from Christ himself. That means Paul's message is not his message, but Christ's message. Paul's gospel is not his gospel, but Christ's gospel. Paul's words are not his word, but Christ's words. In other words, Paul's making the argument, my gospel is not something that comes from man. It is not my opinion. I did not invent it. My gospel is the gospel of Christ. Jesus is the one who gave it to me, and he sent me to teach it to you. So let's put it together. What does it mean for us? It means this. The Christian faith rests not on any human leaders or supernatural experiences, but on the divine revelation of the gospel. Now let me repeat that because this is very important. Christian faith rests not on any human leaders or supernatural experiences, but on the divine revelation of the gospel. This is crucial. Why? Because there are many churches today that define their faith based on the church leaders. If the church leaders say A, they believe A. But then if the church leaders change their mind and believe B, they believe B. And this is extremely problematic. And the church leaders often say, this comes usually come from my circle, charismatic, don't question me. I am God's prophet. God has anointed me. You shall not touch the Lord's anointed. Right? So now, 
if that's what's happened, if we can't question the church leaders' faith and their teaching, and we close our eyes to the truth, here's what happened. It leads to all kinds of gross spiritual abuses. And we can't do that. And Paul is very clear. The gospel has authority over church leaders. If the church leader says something that is not in line with the gospel, then we must reject it. Because the church leaders do not judge the gospel. The gospel judges the church leaders. On the other hand, we have a lot of people who define their faith by supernatural personal experience. So they say what matters is my personal supernatural experience with God. But if you remember what we learned last time, Paul said earlier, remember, even if an angel come to us, it ain't matter. Why? So that means if an angel come to us and say, hey, I want to be your pastor, here's what Paul say. Ask the angel, Mr. Angel, I know you want to be my pastor, but which one is the right order? Justification leads to sanctification? Or sanctification lead to justification. Ask the angel about the gospel. And if the angel get the order wrong, kick that angel out of the church. Because our experiences mean nothing if it's not in line with the gospel. So it means, listen, it doesn't matter if we have a dream. It doesn't matter if we have vision, if we're hearing things. It doesn't matter if we have all the supernatural experiences. Our experience do not judge the gospel. The gospel judge our experiences. Why? Because the gospel is a revelation from God. Now, I'm not saying that we can't trust our church leader or the supernatural experiences. I'm not saying that. But I am saying those should not be our ultimate authority. Whatever is not in line with the gospel must be rejected because the gospel originated from God. But then the question is, how can we be sure that the gospel originated from God? Good question. And Paul will give us both the objective and subjective evidence of the gospel. Let's look at the objective of evidence first. Verse 13 and verse 14. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. Okay, Paul going to give us two objective evidence of the gospel. First, his former life. Paul reminds the church in Galatia who he was before he became a Christian. Because by doing so, he refuted the idea that he came up with the gospel himself. Because think about it. The old Paul did not want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ and Christianity. He did not dislike Christian, or no. He hated Christian. He was a devoted Pharisee. That means he not only studied the scripture, but he lifted out the best he knew how to the point that he persecuted the church and tried to destroy the church because of his Jewish faith. And he saw nothing wrong with it. He saw persecuting and killing Christian as righteous acts. Paul was like an ISIS member who's committed to killing everyone who threatened his faith. That means, if we could make a list of the most unlikely people to become Christian, let me tell you, Paul's name will be at the top of the list. See, over the years, I've had people come up to me whenever I preach the gospel, and people will say, yeah, I get the gospel, yes, I get it. But yes, I don't think God will accept me. I don't think God will forgive me after everything I've done. Because yes, you don't know what I did. You don't know who I was. You have no idea how messed up my love was. And if that's you, listen up. I might have no idea who you were and what you did, but I'm going to let Paul talk to you. Paul will say to you, mate, have you checked me out? I kill and persecute a Christian for fun. I gave my life to destroy the church. Hitler and Osama were like kindies compared to me. What did you do? You punched someone? 
You slept with someone who's not your spouse? You stole some money? Those were nothing compared to what I did. And that is why Paul called himself the chief of all sinners. And the question is, what does it take for a man who was devoted to killing Christian to become a devout Christian? Because every effect must have a cause. So the question is, what is the cause of Paul changed life? Because no human effort could have changed Paul. No apostle could have persuaded Paul because the apostles were his arch enemy. So why did Paul change? There could be only one answer, God. And that's what happened. Paul went to the high priest in Jerusalem and asked him for a letter that allowed him to persecute Christians in Damascus. He passionately hated Christians. But on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, a light from heaven shone around him and he fell to the ground. What happened? Jesus himself appeared to Saul. Here's my question. Who initiated this encounter? Definitely not Paul. Paul was on his way to kill Christian. And yet, in the midst of Paul's messiness, sinfulness, God made the first move. God was the one who orchestrated the Damascus Road experience. And God did not need Paul's permission to do it. He did not need to ask Paul, Paul, I'm going to change your life. Are you okay with that? No. God just did it. And this experience changed Paul's life forever. And he became a preacher of the gospel. And the only possible explanation for Paul's transformation from the destroyer of Christian faith to the builder of Christian faith is and listen, if you question me whether God can save you, whether God can forgive you after everything you've done, here's what Paul say. If God can save me, if God can change me, God can save and change you. This is the first objective evidence of the gospel. But the second, he will give us the harmony of the gospel. In verse 16b to 24, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the region of Syria and Sicilia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing and said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. So this is what Paul said. After he became Christian, he did not immediately consult with anyone. He did not go up to Jerusalem to talk to the apostle about the gospel. But he went to Arabia and Damascus for three years, and we have no idea what he was doing for those three years. We can speculate. But the point is clear. Paul did not consult anyone about the gospel. He did not receive the gospel from the apostle, nor anyone who might be connected to the apostle. God refilled the gospel to him in his fullness during those years of solitude. And after those three years of solitude, Paul went up to Jerusalem to meet Cephas, Peter, and James. And he probably did not meet any other apostle because maybe, you know, they were still afraid of Paul. Because this is the same guy who a few years before worn their hats on a platter. And I am sure in Paul's conversation with Peter and James, Paul learned many things about Jesus' life. And Paul said, I spent 15 days in Jerusalem. But it's the thing about that 15 days. That's not enough for Paul to learn about the gospel. So what Paul tried to say, I did not get the gospel from this hot shot. I don't. And then Paul said, I went to the region of Syria and Sicilia, and he was still unknown at the time. But when people heard Paul preach the gospel, they glorified God because of Paul. Because why? They recognized that Paul's transformed life was trophy of the gospel. That Paul's transformed life and Paul's message can be only attributed to the power of the gospel. There's no adequate explanation of Paul's life and message apart 
from the life-transforming power of the gospel. And that's why they glorify God because of Paul. But listen to what Peter said, okay? This argument will continue in chapter 2. We can talk about it next week. But now, sufficient to say, Peter said this about Paul's letter in 2 Peter 3, verse 15 to 16. And count the passion of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of this matter. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Two things. If we ever read Paul's letter and say, this is confusing. This is really, really hard to understand. Be encouraged. We're not alone. Peter said, they're hard to understand. Okay? So maybe Peter reads Romans chapter 9, you know, and be like, predestined, what? You know, what? God softened, hardened heart? What's happening here? So it's hard. It's not easy to understand. Peter admit that. But second, Peter recognized Paul's letter to be scriptures. That means Peter believed that everything Paul teaches is God's word. And this is important. Why? Because Peter is one of the 12 original apostles. He's one of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and teaching. And Peter said that Paul's word, Paul's gospel, is God's word. So even though Paul did not receive the gospel from the apostle, Paul is not teaching a different gospel from the apostle. Paul's gospel is the same as the apostle because there is only one gospel. Now, this is the second objective evidence of the gospel. There's harmony to it. But that is not enough. My third point, subjective evidence. Verse 15 to 16a. But when he who had set me apart from what before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The gospel must be objective for it to be true, but it also must be subjective. See, the gospel is not only a preposition, but the gospel is power. So that means power. Power is not something that we know intellectually, but power is something that we experience. So it's not either or. It's not head or heart. No, no. It's both. See, Timothy Keller put it this way. If you haven't experienced the gospel, you don't know the gospel. If you say, I know the gospel, but my life hasn't changed, you don't know the gospel. Let me put it in our daily context for you. So if we say, I know God has forgiven me, but it's really hard for me to forgive myself, we don't know the gospel. If we say, I know Jesus' righteousness is my righteousness, but I am continued to feel burdened by guilt and insecurity, we don't know the gospel. If we say, well, I know God loved me perfectly, but I feel like I need to constantly prove myself before God, we don't know the gospel. We can say a thousand times we know the gospel, but we don't. Because the gospel is not just knowledge. It's power. And when the gospel comes into a person's life, it utterly changes that person. Look at what Paul writes. You can see it in the verb that he used. Because if you look at the verb in verses 11 to 14, before this, Paul keeps saying, I, 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 I. Which means Paul is the subject. But in verse 15, there's a change. He suddenly changed, no longer used I, but he used he. Where Paul now no longer the subject, but Paul is the object. Which tells us one of the way we know we experience the gospel is this. When the gospel comes to us, we know it's not so much as something that we decide on, but rather it's something that happened to us. It's not so much that me trying to find God, but it's God seeking me. We see ourselves as the object of an action rather than subject because we sense somehow there's this power outside of us that comes to us and changes us from the inside. Paul said, I never look for God. 
It was the grace of God that pressured me. It was mercy that found Paul. And that is the gospel. The gospel is not me trying to find God. The gospel is God pursuing me. You and I, we did not do anything that deserve, uh, make us deserve to be saved at all. In fact, you and I did not even want to be saved. We were God's enemy. Like a thief hid from police, we hid from God. But the good news of the gospel, there's not a single millimeter in the universe that we can hide from God. There's no area in this cosmos universe that's beyond God's reach. He pursues us to the end of the earth because His grace alone. And God's grace pursue us not because anything we do or don't do, but because we were set apart by God. Paul writes that God set him apart from before he was born. And God was pleased to reveal Jesus to him, which means the only reason Paul was safe, the only reason you and I are safe is because God is pleased to do so. God set his grace on us not because we were worthy of it, but simply because God took pleasure in doing so. So when the gospel comes to us, we don't feel like I am the one who makes the decision, I am the one who makes the effort. When the gospel comes to us, we know that something happened to us, something came to us. There's a power outside of us that radically changes us from the inside. Let me put it in a simpler term. God does not set his heart on us because we are beautiful. He set his heart on us simply because he loves us. And when the gospel comes to you, it clicks. You feel it. You know it. There's something outside of you that makes you acceptable before God. Full stop. That's the gospel. But that's not the end. Why was God pleased to reveal Jesus to Paul? Paul says this so that I might preach Christ among the Gentiles. In other words, God revealed Christ to Paul so that he could reveal Christ through Paul. Now, do you see? So that means the gospel, the grace of God, does not stop at our salvation. Because when the grace of God comes into our life, there's this call that we know that we are called to his service. And this was separate mere religious people from gospel people. Because the gospel people not only believe the gospel intellectually, they not only believe in Christ intellectually, but they said there's this personal relationship between me and God right now. And this personal relationship means that now my life belongs to God and my life is affected by who God is. And now this relationship are given to me not only for my personal joy, but I have responsibility to reveal Christ through my life. And that is why we see a 180-degree change in Paul. He was a fanatical hater of the gospel who became a bold preacher of the gospel. And not to the Jews. He became a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles, the very people he hated as radical Jew. The gospel radically transformed Paul's life. So here's the question. Has that happened to you? Have you experienced that life-transforming power of the gospel? Or do you simply know the gospel but never experience the life-changing power of the gospel? Can people who have known you for a while see the change in you and glorify God because of you? See, you can't separate, we can't separate the objectivity and subjectivity of the gospel. They go together. That's what makes the gospel the gospel. Let's listen. Objectivity, truth, without subjectivity experience will become knowledge that puffs up. Subjectivity experience without objectivity, truth, will become an emotional sensation that leads us astray. That's why we can't choose one over the other. The gospel is both. The gospel has objective truth that is unchanging. And those truth, when you know it and you experience it, it radically transforms your life. And here's a part that I did not see until I read Keller's commentary on the passage. I mean, I read Galatians so many times already. I love the book. One of my favorite books in the Bible. 
But when I read Keller's commentaries, only in the last few months I realized how beautiful what Paul says when, God, when he said that God sent him apart, set him apart from before he was born. Because do you know what it means? It means that the grace of God has been shaping and preparing Paul all his life for the things that God was going to call him to do. This is astonishing. Tim Keller put it this way. It's quite a long quote. That was beautiful. Paul had been resisting God and doing so much wrong. But God was overruling all his intention and using his experiences and even his failure to prepare him first for his conversion and then to be a preacher to the Gentiles. The Old Testament knowledge, the zeal, the training, the effort he was using to oppose God and his church, all were being used by God to break him and to equip him to be God's instrument for building his church. God has been working all along to use Paul to establish the very faith he opposed. When I read that, my finite mind, because that means God had planned Paul to be an apostle to Gentile before there were any apostles. All this was planned by God from the very beginning. See, God did not swoop down on Paul five seconds before Paul committed his life to God. Oh, no. But God used absolutely everything. The good and bad he did. The good and bad done to him. God put them together as a way of setting Paul apart to become the person God wanted him to be. Do you know what it means for you and me? It means that if we are Christian, listen, if we are Christian, that means everything about us. The good and bad things we did, the good and bad things done to us, God is so great, He has woven them all together to make us the people He wanted us to be. So if we believe the gospel, now the gospel gives us new lens by which we can review our life and see how in every single detail of our life, God is preparing us, even through our sins and failure, to become carrier of the gospel to the world. Now, I don't know what kind of past it is that you try to hide from people. I don't know what kind of burden, what kind of shameful thing that you don't want anyone to know. What kind of hidden sin, that skeleton that you try to cover as best as you can. I don't know what kind of summer holiday that you had that you don't want anyone to know, not even your brothers and sisters. But one thing that we can know for sure, when you put your faith in Jesus, God is that sovereign. God is that good. God is that powerful. He said, I can use that. I can use that hidden sin. I can use that shameful thing that you did in the past. I can use the summer that you don't want anyone to know for my purpose. He's that good. He's that sovereign. God is that good and sovereign that he can use our sin to accomplish his good purposes. The gospel is life transforming gospel. And I want to end in this verse, verse 10. And I know we covered this first in the last sermon, but it's extremely relevant to Paul's testimony. This is what he said in verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I will not be a servant of Christ. Let me ask you a question. The gospel that Paul preached. Is it from God or from men? If it's from God, why do we have to fear men? There are two ways for us to live. We can live with the fear of men or we can live with the fear of God. And Paul says, the gospel has set us free from the fear of men. What is the fear of men? The fear of man is when we elevate the importance of people so that we crave their approval or we fear their disapproval. It means their praise and condemnation speak louder to our heart than the approval of God. 
And isn't this why there are many of us who are afraid to share the gospel with other people? We do not want to offend other people. We do not want to lose their approval. We want people to like us. Let me talk, talk about you. Let me talk about me. This is my biggest problem in life. You know what's my biggest problem in life? I am a people pleaser. And oftentimes, I'd rather keep the gospel to myself than offend people around me with the gospel. Because think about it, life is hard enough already without me having to offend people with the gospel. I have other issues. I have other problems. But do you know what that is mean? Do you know what that is? That's the fear of man. Then what is the fear of God? The fear of God is not when we are scared of God. The fear of God is when we are in awe of God. We are amazed by God. We are captivated by God. And here's the thing. The fear of God and the fear of man cannot coexist. One must go. And if we are still trying to please man, we cannot please God. Christian cannot be a man pleaser. So here's the question that I want to end us in sermon with. Then how does the gospel then remove that fear of man? Not by destroying our desire for approval, but by satisfying our desire for approval. Do you know why we fear people? Do you know why we fear men? Here's why. Because people can humiliate us. People can reject us. And people can threaten us. And the gospel tells us all those things happened to Jesus. See, at the cross, Jesus was humiliated. He was stripped naked and crucified as a criminal. At the cross, Jesus was rejected. The people that he came to save say no to him. And the God who sent him to earth also turned his face away from Jesus. See, at the cross, Jesus experienced rejection from both heaven and earth. And at the cross, Jesus was not only being threatened. At the cross, he was executed. Why? Why did Jesus go through all that? So that when you and I put our faith in Jesus, this is what happened. You and I have no reason whatsoever to fear people. Because in the gospel, we see God who covers the humiliated, accepts the rejected, and protects the threatened. Why? Because Jesus has took the punishment that you and I deserve. So that right now in the gospel, we see a God who is smiling at us, who has given us his complete approval, who is pleased with us, not because of something that we do, but because of something that Jesus has done for us. So now the only person whose opinion matter in the whole universe sees us as absolute beauty, gorgeous, beautiful. We are holy, righteous, blameless in God's sight. So the gospel gives us deep security that there's nothing we can do to make God, us, God love us more and nothing we have done to make God love us less. And if we get this, if we experience the gospel, then it doesn't matter what people think about us. The sovereign God of the universe is pleased with us. So now, we can boldly share the gospel with people around us. Look at Paul, and I'm done. Paul is sending a letter to the church in Galatia, upset, angry, mad. He's not afraid of offending everyone in the church of Galatia with the gospel. Not because Paul hates them, but because Paul loved them dearly. He understands that the truth of the gospel is non-negotiable. There's only one gospel, and any variation of that gospel is not gospel. And therefore, Paul says, do not, do not, do not trade the true gospel with counterfeit gospel, because it will rob you of your joy in God. And Paul risked his relationship with the Galatians for the sake of their joy. Question is, will you and I do the same? Will we take this life-transforming gospel and share it with other people? 
Because the gospel that radically transformed my life has the power to radically transform other people's life. And if we are still trying to please men, we cannot be a servant of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you make the gospel come alive to us. For many of us in this place, we know the gospel. We heard about the gospel week in, week out. But the coin has yet to drop. But I pray, Lord, that the gospel will not just be objectively true in our life, but it's subjectively true. Because it is the very power of God that radically transforms us. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you do this supernatural work in our heart. You're the only one who can. I can only talk. I can only argue. I can only offend people. But you're the only one who can transform people. So do that in our heart, Holy Spirit. Continue this supernatural work in our heart. As we continue our journey in the book of Galatians, I pray that you continue to restructure our heart in such a way that we no longer fear people. But we are captivated by you and what you've done for us at the cross. Because the gospel is a life transforming gospel. May our life be transformed by the beauty of it. And we ask this in the name of your beloved Son Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Listen to our faith as we sing.